thank you very much. Certainly the most random introduction of all time uh, <laughs> uh, from John. Uh, Keith, uh, welcome. Um, morning. Good morning, everyone. I, I'm going to pick up on straight off from that um, discussion you had with the IAB in the US mm -hmm. in February. You were very crisp, very clear about um, the issues, the digital marketing issues as you saw them as a major advertiser. Um, you were gracious enough to talk about some unintended consequences of the very fast pace of technology. Of course, the more colorful language that got picked up was draining the swamp. We recognize there's a lot to be done, and you just heard uh, John talk a little bit about the gold standard, which we think is a great first step in there. What's your view of progress? Uh, well, before I just talk about progress, I think, I think we all need to stand back and sort of take check where we are, because we're all part of this this new supply chain, the wonderful digital media supply chain and the way we engage in it. And wherever you are, um, either as a consumer, but of course also uh, in the industry, uh, you touch on it. And I think what was, what was striking last year, I mean, for some time I've been talking about the three Vs of viewability, verification and value, that you know, the, the standard should be you see what you pay for. And the idea there's a standard that you pay for half the pixel seems to me like bizarre. Third party verification, that um, yes, we know uh, something has been seen, it's been seen by a human um, and not a bot, um, and, uh, and we know that it's done, been done in a, a brand safe environment, then value is bringing all that together and making sure we pay the same price. But what happened last year was, was something I think quite different. And we saw this sort of collapse of trust um, around the world. Um, and I think most brought uh, to bear by the Edelman Trust Barometer, yeah. which they uh, share at um, Davos, the World Economic Forum, each year. And I thought what was striking there, particularly because we're talking about digital media, is the, um, the trust in, in media, the split between traditional media, newspapers, TV, etc., which was up at 59%. Um, and then you saw the trust on social media down at 32%. Um, and even before that, but that was, I think, brought it together just in two wonderful numbers, uh, we could see that this was starting to impact society, um, and it wasn't no longer sort of an industry issue like we're sitting chatting here. Uh, this would begin to shape society and how people felt about the world, each other, etc. Uh, and that's why the IAB uh, came out with these sort of three commitments. The first commitment was we would um, only invest in responsible platforms, uh, defined by um, platforms that, um, that you know, respected children and didn't bring uh, division into society. Um, again, only invest in responsible content. Um, and we started off saying that we wanted to unstereotype, uh, particularly around gender-based uh, content, but obviously that's going to be a, a longer agenda. But first of all, let's you know, see what sort of content uh, uh, we are all responsible for and, and influencing the very people who are looking uh, at all this content. And then the last one about responsible infrastructure. Um, and uh, particularly highlight the need to get to one measurement system. Uh, we have, as an industry, done quite a good job over the years of being able to optimize across media. But as you know right now, with the walled gardens, etc., uh, having an overall view um, on a one measurement system across the whole of media isn't possible. And what, and what does that result in? Is it means we overserve people ads. You've all been overserved ads, uh, which is annoying, as you know. Uh, also, though, it's not very efficient for advertisers. But also we underserve people as well because there are people we can't see because we can't see the whole picture. So those are the three commitments, responsible platform, responsible content, responsible infrastructure. Um, and what I'm pleased to say is there is some really significant progress. Now you might say, we always say that, don't we? But actually I think there has been a step change in pace. And Do you I mean think, progress from our side, from the media side? I think progress, acro yes, ac across the digital media platform. Okay. It's real, real progress. I think one of the, the most striking ones that's happened, I suppose, since the beginning of last year through last year and into this year is both um, Google slash YouTube and Facebook uh, are now taking uh, responsibility for the content on their platform. Now, you can argue about to what degree, etc. But remember, up until the um, uh, beginning of last year, both of them were saying that we are sort of uh, media platforms and what's on the content uh, on our platforms isn't, isn't our responsibility, yeah. it's the responsibility that people put it on, which of course it is. But it's also they have uh, some responsibility as well. And both YouTube and Facebook have made big steps, steps that way. So in a quarter, I don't know if you know this, but in a quarter, YouTube uh, took 8 million uh, videos um, uh, off. 81% um, uh, is a combination of IA uh, and humans. 
81% were flagged by a machine, and 75% of those videos were removed before there was one uh, impression. Uh, and that's a massive shift. Um, now, uh, again, there's many millions more to go, but that's real, um, a, a real lean-in. Uh, the other one is, is on Facebook. They've, you know, they've doubled the amount of people they now have, uh, up to 14,000. Uh, I believe we need more humans checking content, particularly content uh, around children. Um, but uh, the combination of increase on AI, increase on humans, um, we are getting to a better place. M more to do. Uh, I think what I'm most encouraged about though now is, is lots of people are joining this conversation. I encourage everyone in this room to join this conversation. The more voices that say, actually, this is not good for our business, it's not good for our brands, but it's not good for our children and our children's children to have an internet uh, which isn't where we want it to be. And ultimately, if we don't, and that's why I love your gold standards, you know, if we don't provide good quality digital advertising, more than ever before, people can screen it out. Sure. Now, there's always been screening out of ads, yeah? TV ads. It was, um, TV ads came on and you got up and went outside to make a cup of tea. That was ad blocking. It was physical ad blocking, but it was ad blocking. But of course, with um, uh, the, the mobile phone and, and, uh, and the desktop, you can now you know, automatically ad block. 600 million people are already doing it. As an industry, we're going to have a real, real problem if people start screening out our ads. It won't pay for free search on Google, free uh, posting, um, you know, Google Maps, etc. All this is paid for by advertising, as we all know. I don't think a lot of people know that, but we all know that. And we need to make sure that the advertising is fit for purpose, that people enjoy advertising and watch advertising. It will help us build our brands, but ultimately it will support a free press. Yeah. It's clear you see a role for advertisers alongside or maybe even as against government and regulation in the future of our, of our industry. Are, are you a strong believer in, in self-regulation? Yeah, I am actually. I mean, of course, like all these things, it's, it is, it's wonderful at a very simplistic level to say, hold on, if we have all these problems and they're so obvious, why don't we just create a, a whole host of laws to sort it all out? Yeah, yeah. And of course, at the face of it, when you're uh, sitting around chatting to, to someone at a, a dinner party, that, that does sound like a wonderful solution. But as we all know, the, the tricky thing about this, this whole technology world, it's moving so fast. Uh, in fact, actually, the other day, I was, um, I was shown a, a Facebook playbook that we developed uh, for our marketers. We have um, five and a half thousand marketers around the world. And uh, we had a Facebook playbook we developed five years ago uh, for how to do advertising and build brands on Facebook. It bears no resemblance at all uh, to obviously how you build brands on Facebook today. But then I looked at the Facebook playbook we had only but two years ago. Yeah. Bears no resemblance to how we're building brands today on Facebook. Now, the one we have right now, I don't know what the shelf life is, but yeah. um, it's not going to last for long. So in that fast-changing world, the idea that um, a, a regulator can, can understand and get ahead of to create something, I, I think, is an unrealistic um, expectation. I think consumers and technology are moving faster than, than, than industry anyway. I think what, one of our big challenges is, is we used to, as marketers, used to lead consumers. You know, we'd be out in the future welcoming them as they arrive. Yeah. And now a lot of marketers <laughs> are sort of chasing to get ahead and, and because we all have fantastic devices in our pockets and technology, etc. You all know this. The technology you have at work is less than the technology you have at home. That's because you know, we're all buying this technology, but as a, as a uh, individual, we are buying really sharp technology that you know, industry is finding hard to keep up with. And that's the same for our consumer base. So if you think about that, what's the chances of, um, of, of regulations? Uh, so I think self-regulation is the way we have to go. Yeah. Let's talk a bit about the changing shape of marketing. And um, you know, I'm particularly interested in the direct-to-consumer brands. Unilever is, is launching some. Is, is this, a, 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 is this the, the big future? Is this a passing phase? No, I think it is a big future. I think what's happened, um, and again, it's the, it's the wonderful thing about technology and data, um, is for the first time, brand builders like us can have a direct relationship with individuals. So this idea of mass personalization is, is, a, is a possibility uh, for all of us right now. And I think what's really exciting about this is, you know, if I go back to the early days and you know, the 80s or whatever, we were using secondhand data from retailers that was three months old uh, to, to predict the future. Yeah. Uh, now, of course, we can have real-time data, we can do real-time content, it can be in the language, in the moment, in the culture. 
Um, I can serve you up ads uh, on a hot day in a park for a magnum, because I know it's a hot day, I know you're in a park, and I can even tell you where the nearest store is and give you a coupon. Uh, and I think that direct connect um, uh, is going to be really powerful for advertisers, not just in targeting, but actually developing content. Because again, if I know you're interested in horses and surfing, I can give you content on, with horses and surfing, and you're going to be more interested. We've done quite a few experiments in this area. Surprise, surprise, all of us are more engaged with content if the content is about something we're interested in. Now, that doesn't sound like uh, the, the biggest breakthrough. <laughs> Genius. Uh, but the truth of the matter is, we didn't have the opportunity to do that, that one-to-one -one marketing uh, at scale. So I think the first thing is um, building first-party data, which, of course, lots of companies have had, but actually companies like ours didn't have. Mm. Um, and we've always done a second and third-party data to, to build that knowledge. We, we've been quite public about it. We want to build uh, a billion relationships, so a billion uh, first-party data to augment our second and third party data, which I think will give us a, a, a point of view and, and build relationships like, like never before. I mean, a billion's a reasonable number uh, by anyone's stretch of imagination. But that's about relationships and about uh, building brands. And I think in this cluttered world, this cluttered digital world, um, uh, we need to find more engaging ways to build our brands. And hence, the work um, uh, I've been doing around brands with purpose or brands with meaning, brands that right. matter, whatever hmm. technology uh, term you use. But Brands with Purpose is about building brands with real meaning that we all want to spend some time with and engage with. It's not just about functional benefits, it's, it's, it's more than that. Uh, and if you start going down that path about creating more engaging brands, then why wouldn't we want to sell directly to consumers as well? Now, don't for a second think that you know, a soup and soap company like ours is going to get into, uh, you know, every day two and a half billion people use our products. There's no way we're going to, two and a half billion people can we go direct to. So uh, absolutely retailing, mass retailing is going to be the backbone of our business for, for years to come. But if you look at T2 as an example, you look at Dollar Shave Club, uh, I can name quite a few more, My Mustard. Uh, we're now doing direct cons to consumer and we're, we're learning a lot how to do that better. Mm. And ultimately, while we can't do it right now, direct, direct to consumer because of the last mile, two miles is so expensive, we can all imagine a day with robots and, and um, uh, um, uh, drones, etc., where that could become possible. So let's build the muscles now and learn how to do it for a future where it could be a part of our business. Very interesting. I'm okay, just moving just around this horizon of uh, interesting that we've got such a short time. Agencies. Let me talk, let's just talk about agencies. You've reduced your roster by a half yeah. to still a substantially large number. Um, uh, you've, the in-house agency, you studio in 20 countries now. Yeah. Um, do you see more brand owners bringing traditional agency functions in-house? Well, I think the first thing to say is um, I'm a great supporter of agencies, love agencies. Uh, we've worked with agencies for years and we will carry on working for agencies. I think the big challenge for the, the agency world, though, um, you were talking, uh, we were talking earlier about regulation, about the, the world moving faster. The world has moved very fast, and, and my experience is, is the agencies haven't moved fast enough. Um, and frankly, yeah, I was talking about data. Yeah, we've also built 26 people data centers around the world uh, where we are, are, are scraping uh, off the, the social network, uh, insight, etc. Agencies he shouldn't uh, be... Uh, enabling companies like ours to do that. And what do I mean? They should have got ahead of us, and they should have been building that sort of capability themselves mm -hmm. and offering it to us as a service, and mm -hmm. me saying, oh, gosh, that's what I need. I hadn't thought of that. Um, and similarly, if you are going to do much more content, we're all developing much more content, we're all seeing much more content, we don't have big buckets of money. Um, the amount of, of money we're spending on developing content isn't going up. Uh, in fact, if it does go up, you're, all you're going to do is take it out of your media, which isn't very efficient. Mm. So whatever you're spending on content, if you're producing more content, you don't have to be a genius to say, then you need to produce content in a, a cheaper, more economical way. But then if you turn around to an agency and they say, well, actually, you know, the cost of doing this is this, and then you can develop an in-house capability, and you can say, well, actually, the cost of doing this is this minus 30%. Mm. You then start saying, well, actually, I'm, I'm going to have a blended model. Um, and I would argue back to the agencies is, is you need to create a fit for purpose, competitive model uh, to work in this modern world. Um, if I turn around and said to you, um, okay, uh, um, this is how much it costs for PG tips. 
Um, and PG Tips is going to go up 10% uh, in price because I need that to create the content to build PG Tips. Uh, I'd be out of business. What I have to do is create a business model um, that, that is the right price for the consumer and then work back the costs. Hmm. And I believe what agencies need to do is work out what is the right price for uh, advertisers to produce uh, competitively in today's world hmm. and work back and then work out a business model that delivers that. Hmm. Telling, telling me that I can't do it at that price, absolutely fine. Do you know what the answer is? I'll find someone who can. Hmm. Um, and that's what we've done uh, with the U Studio. So, I think there's everything to play for in the agency world if they reinvent themselves. Um, uh, and they've done a lot of work, don't get me wrong, but they reinvent themselves to the challenges of a fragmented media world with fragmented copy, with need of agility, uh, real-time uh, content on one side, and, and brilliant, engaging, seek-out content on the other. Mm -hmm. um, it's never been so complex, which should be, never been such a good opportunity to build an agency solution. Because... What you can then sell to people like myself is simplifying the complexity. Don't push the problem back to me. Yeah. You simplify the complexity and I'll buy your product. Yeah. We talked a bit about technology and, and Unilever is obviously not waiting for the technology to come to you um, with uh, the foundry, Unilever Ventures. What are the exciting things coming out of those initiatives? Yeah, I think what's exciting about this, and, and this is, of course, the, the one wonderful part of business right now, I think there's never been such an exciting time to be in business, never been such an exciting time to be in marketing. Um, and I started the Unilever Foundry because I kept bumping into to startups, and we started trying to work with them, and we'd kill them, basically. I mean, like, it's, you know, it's open up the fire hose of well-meaning um, people from uh, Unilever <laughs> with huge amount of resources, and, and you're a tiny startup, and you just get crunched. So what we said um, with the Unilever Foundry is we would like to help you get from pitch to pilot. So um, here's a brief. This is what I'd like to do. If you've got a solution, come to us, uh, and we'll um, help you up to $50,000 um, to get from pitch to pilot um, with some coaching, etc. And actually, we're not interested in, in pilot. We're interested in pilot to scale. Um, and then if your pilot goes well, we'll help you scale. And we've now scaled over uh, 100 uh, startups uh, uh, around the world. Uh, and it's really helped bring fresh thinking and, and, and fresh thoughts uh, um, into, the, um, uh, into the marketing mix. Uh, and it's, it's made us think differently about how we do innovation, mm -hmm. um, you know, lean startup um, thinking on innovation, what they can do with no money that you turn to a brand manager and they say they need 100,000 to, to do. You know? mm -hmm. So we've learned a lot from that. We've also actually moving into the Unilever Ventures uh, enabled us to uh, invest in some. So this, the, the Unilever Foundry is us putting marketing dollars to work uh, with the startups. Unilever Ventures is where we invest in, in, right. in companies. Um, and uh, an example of that would be Discuss.io, uh, which is a, a fantastic way of, of doing basic quality research groups on video uh, on your computer. Uh, if I wanted now to speak to five, um, I don't know, young guys in, in, in Kenya, uh, I could have an, an, uh, eight people on my screen within about 30 minutes and have a conversation, etc. Uh, around the world, or indeed, if you want to hear about people uh, up in, in Birmingham, the same, the same thing. Um, and we've now invested in them as well. Uh, I could ch chuck in Seltra. I see they're one of your sponsors. Yeah. Uh, Seltra we work with, but we also invest at Uni Ventures. We take about 5 to 15%. So right. we're not taking meaningful shares in, in, in sort of ownership, but more to learn and, and to, to work uh, with those companies. Right. We've got, to, we've got to finish in a moment. I just want to give you the sort of final knock it out the park question about your, your big challenges and your biggest wins over your eight or so years as CMO of Unilever. God. <laughs> uh, how do you do that in a couple of minutes at the end? Uh, yeah. Eight years. Uh, well, let's go a little bit more recent. Um, okay. So big challenges. I think the big challenges that we still have, um, and I also allude to a little bit, but I think we all have, is for brands is integrating in this fragmenting world. And I think our real challenge here is, is on one side, there's marvelous opportunity to use you know, mobile and social and e-commerce, etc. cetera. Um, and what we have... We're at risk of doing, and again, this is part of the agency fragmentation which drives this as well, yeah. is we optimize for the different channels and we don't optimize for the brand. And so we all see it ourselves as brands being pulled apart. Our budgets, of course, but also actually the image, the identity of the brands across all these different platforms. Mm -hmm. And what we need to do is integrate, integrate, integrate. I think the agencies can help that by integrating their offer. 
You know, if I go back to when I used to go to JWT in Barclay Square in the <coughs> 80s, they used to sit down and say, here's your TV, here's your poster, here's your radio. I didn't go to three different agencies. So you'd rather have that than be able to cherry pick specialist I, I think I think I, I, want, I want the opportunity to do both. So okay. I, would, I would rather have the opportunity to have someone who integrated the communication needs uh, and uh, also for us to, to pick specialists as well. Uh, and that blended model, I think, would work well. But okay. right now, we don't. We, there's no one doing a proper blended model out there. Uh, there was people attempting to, but no one um, uh, integrating um, the, the the whole challenge. So that's a challenge. Uh, and then, um, what would be um, something I'm, I'm uh, uh, proud of? I think most recently, actually, is the work we've done around unstereotype and unstereotype alliance, um, and, and really using advertising as a force for good. Uh, at Unilever, we try and use our business as a force for good. We have the Unilever Sustainable Living Plan. Uh, if you haven't. Uh, seen it, please do have a look on our website. It's holding ourselves to account for everything from uh, getting 100% of our agricultural raw materials uh, sourced sustainably by 2020, or all our packaging to be recyclable, compostable, or reusable by 2025. Um, but also it goes into things like um, how can we use our advertising dollars for good as well. And the Unstereotype Alliance thought, quite simply, starting first on gender, and particularly uh, women, is, is advertising um, uses really unhelpful um, stereotypes. And you could say, well, uh, yeah, it helps us do things in a short time. No, they are, they're caught in ad world. Um, and uh, we can't um, push society forward unless we have advertising which is more progressive. We did a piece of research across industries, uh, so not just consumer goods, across industries, and, and women told us that they didn't I identify um, uh, with the women in the ads 60% of the time. 60% of the time. Hold on, we're trying to engage people in our <laughs> advertising. So I would think one of the way of engaging people is to have imagery um, that people can, can engage with. And then we found, uh, when we looked closer um, at the details, in only 3% of the ads were women in obvious leadership positions. In 2% of the ads were women uh, um, obviously portrayed as being intelligent. And in 1% of the ads being portrayed with a sense of humor. Now, that doesn't reflect any of the women I know, but that's the ad world we're feeding, by the way, to, to our daughters and, and, and uh, around the world about how we see, see women. This, I think, is, is just wrong. But then when you go and look in more detail, we did it with Unilever ads and looked at our more progressive ads, surprise, surprise, our more progressive ads were 25% more effective. So this isn't just a moral issue. This is an economic issue. We yeah. can produce better advertising. So we got together last year um, with UN Women uh, um, uh, chairing this, and we'll do it again in Cannes in a couple of weeks' time. The Unstereotype Alliance, we have advertisers like ourselves. Uh, uh, Mark Pritchard, um, CMO of Proctors, came to it. Uh, we had J&J. &J, um, uh, we had uh, um, a whole uh, host of uh, advertisers. We had the advertising agencies. So we had WPP, Interpublic, Omnicom, um, Publicists. Uh, we had NGOs like um, a, a Gina Davis uh, Institute. Uh, we had the WFA. We had the ANA, um, and then we had the Google, the Facebook, Twitter, etc. Now, why do I list them all out? Because I want more people to get involved. If you imagine that, that is. Oh, by the way, Alibaba. I see you on the front oh, yeah. of the uh, drum outside. So Chris Tung, the CMO of Alibaba, was there as well. Uh, and we're making commitments about what are the standards we're going for, but also making commitments about the research we're going to do to track progress. And then we're going to hold ourselves and ultimately the industry um, and really hold up a mirror about where are we right now in stereotyping gender, first female, but then male, uh, and, and then how are we collectively going to create advertising which is more reflective of society today rather than reflective of society in the 60s and the 70s. Um, and if we can pull that off, uh, I think the whole industry could be really proud yeah. of making a real impact on society in a positive way uh, for the generations to come. Keith, some very big ideas to start our day. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.